Oh, Garkov is famous for many things. Unfortunately, if you Google him in the United States, the only thing that comes up is that Marshal Garkov was the, the Soviet marshal who told the Politburo in a private meeting, do not go into Afghanistan. So that's what we remember him for. But the truth is that Ogarkov looked at us, and he looked at the capabilities that were emerging in the United States and the West, and he said, we see now the potential for a global reconnaissance strike complex emerging, consisting of strike weapons, intelligence surveillance, reconnaissance assets. Ogarkov was right. Of course, we've never done it, but I think that's going to start happening. It's not going to be global immediately. It's going to be regional, I think, at the outset. And I think we're, we hopefully will move beyond ISR strike and think of a maneuver strike ISR and sustainment complex that integrates the capabilities of all the services within the regional unified commands for employment. I think you're gonna see it emerge. It's gonna change warfare. It is not going to produce, by the way, perfect situational awareness. Uh-uh, not gonna happen. You're never gonna know everything all the time as General Shinseki insisted on FCS will never happen. There will always be countermeasures. There will always be surprise. Mines, barbed wire, RPGs will still be effective. So will automatic cannon fire, direct gun fire, along with a host of other technologies. So don't walk away from this and say, McGregor is preaching, you know, the, the sort of FCS bit. Absolutely not. But we have thousands of capabilities and assets in, in space, at sea, under sea, as well as on land. These can be organized and netted with those strike systems. And this not only acts as a potential weapon for offensive operations, once we build this, it'll take us 10 years to organize and make this work, it will operate as a huge deterrent to anyone who might want to threaten or challenge us. And of course, you see Eisenhower, poor guy, he opposed the 1947 National Security Act, and he too was thanked for his national interest in national defense, so I don't feel so bad about what happened to me. Next slide. How should we modernize? Look, FCS, almost $19 billion lost. Fundamentally, nothing sprung from the, from the program that makes any difference. The few things that did work were largely co-opted into it. Boeing made out brilliantly. Uh, the people responsible for it, many of them now work for Boeing, who used to be in uniform, which is disturbing. How do we do it? Well, we have to change the way we do business. We cannot bind the Army through a 20, 30-year process to turn out 20 or 30,000 copies of equipment. Look, 30 years elapsed, roughly, between the beginning of World War I and the dropping of the atom bomb. Think about it. Just 30 years. We went from horse-drawn artillery, hundreds of thousands of men with rifles, to a nuclear explosion in 30 years. How much do you think is going to change in fundamental technological terms over the next 30 years? So the notion of turning out 20,000 versions of FCS is absurd. Or the ground vehicle, what are they calling it, the, the ground combat vehicle. Instead, we need to look at what is good and what works and field small numbers of what's good and what works now. But the only way to do this, by the way, is to divest yourself of inventories of thousands upon thousands of M1 tanks, thousands upon thousands of Bradleys, thousands and thousands of 113s. You've got to do that. Nobody wants to do that. The generals don't want to do it, neither does industry. In fact, the preference right now is to do what? Rebuild the old stuff because that's a guaranteed way for everyone to line their pockets. It's also the way to ensure that in 10 years, you are not in a position to cope with an enemy that can fight back, an enemy with air, ground, naval forces, access to space-based surveillance, and so forth. That's not where we need to go. The Puma is probably the best current vehicle out there. I've been preaching Puma since the early part of this century when, it's, when it first came out. We need to look at it, and again, the first thing I think we should have done is to buy small numbers of them and ship them to Afghanistan and Iraq and find out what they will do. But there's enormous resistance to that sort of thing because there's always a danger that we find out what? Oh my God, it works, and it's effective. 
And that disturbs the whole plan for the industrial age model, which is a repetition of the past and the future. The other point is uh, the lady up top uh, who spoke at the Paris Air Show made this statement. I, I can't over, overstate the importance of that. We are not investing in R&D in the Department of Defense. In most of the defense industries, research and development is at about 2.1% and falling. Why? The focus is on the next quarter. There is no long-term focus. And there isn't any long-term focus right now in the Department of Defense. The, the focus in the Department of Defense is surviving the, the budget cuts. And that's not enough. That won't work. Next slide. Now, this may be the most important slide in the presentation. Ruth Collins, you know, told me, uh, are you going to talk about leadership? And I said, well, you know, yeah, of course, but in a, in a broad context. We need a new human capital strategy, not just in the Army, across the armed forces. We need to think differently about how people are selected, brought in, cultivated, trained, and advanced. Do we really think that we can maintain the old pre 1945 model of keeping someone for 30 years or 35 years or 40 years. How many people today in American society are prepared for that or really want to do that? It's, it's not viable. So we're going to have to look at, at new ways for people to move horizontally between the society and the military establishment. And that's going to change the way we think about how we select and advance people. This guy, Peter Luscher, is somebody you ought to look up He's smart. He took over Siemens when the, the place was in a terrible crisis a few years ago in 2007. They were under investigation for all sorts of improprieties. He came in, he looked at Siemens, and he said, well, we can take care of the integrity problem. We'll just get rid of all these people. But we've got a bigger problem. We have an industrial age Siemens. We have all these corporate boards. And, and the people at the time were prepared to do what? Shed engineers. Shed engineers, keep it going, keep the cash machine running so we can stuff the cash in our pockets. And he said, no. He said, ultimately, the cash machine will break down. You've got to invest in your engineers. You've got to invest more in research and development. That's the future for Siemens. And he abolished 200 corporate boards, eliminated half the people that were on the Siemens board, dramatically shrank the uh, overhead in the company. Today, Siemens is going gangbusters. Siemens is in China. Siemens is in Africa. Siemens is in Australia. Siemens is here. You know, they are the leaders in the world for the transmission of energy over distance. They are the leaders in the world with turbine engines that turn out energy. So there's something in this for us. That is the way we need to think today in the United States Army. We cannot think in terms of, well, you know, we need to keep those three-star headquarters because once they're gone, we'll never get them back. Maybe we never needed them to begin with. Maybe we can do without them. And why do we have to have a three or a four-star everywhere? Can we do it with a two or a one? And again, when I wrote Breaking the Phalanx and I wrote Transformation Under Fire, I was always interested in getting rid of the colonel level of command so that you went from lieutenant colonel in command to brigadier in command, to get more people younger, faster to one star. That's something else that he's done, brought younger people up faster. And if we don't do that, the talent we need now and will need in the future will not stay. That's not what they want. Last bullet. This is what I call C2I, character, competence, and intelligence. John Wayne said it best. What did John Wayne say? He said, life is tough. It's tougher if you're stupid. <laughs> okay? We got to get out of this business of promoting our buddies, the guys we like. Oh, I like him. He's a good guy and a real warfighter. Warfighter? What has he done? Who are you talking about? Oh, you know, he's a real warfighter. I said, really? Has he ever pulled a trigger and killed anybody in action? Well, no, but he's a real war fighter. <laughs> I said, has he ever been under fire? Well, not really. And well, what makes him a war fighter? He's a good guy. Crap needs to stop. John Kenneth Galbraith made a study in the early 1990s of the financial crises in the history of the United States, going back into the late 1800s and up through most of the 20th century. 
And he discovered something. He, he was curious as to how the people that were at the top of all these financial institutions that suddenly failed and went under had gotten there. And he discovered one very straightforward attribute that everyone shared. And that attribute was predictability. We tend, in all of these environments, private sector, bureaucratic, we tend to pick people who are predictable. By predictable, I mean people who are going to do what we would do. And when I say we, I'm talking about the people who are already in charge. People who seem to think like we do. And people who are not predisposed to do what? Challenge the status quo. And this works. This works actually for many, many years, sometimes decades, as he found out, until the day comes when you confront that existential crisis. Because in the intervening period, these predictable people have made lots of mistakes, but the mistakes are always concealed. They're buried. Until finally the existential crisis hits, bang, and you've got to do something. And that's what happened with Lusher at Siemens. By the way, that's what happened with George C. Marshall in 1939. And I think we, today, in the United States Army, are on the verge of, actually some people say already in it, but certainly at the beginning of an existential crisis. It's back to those critical questions. What are we going to bring to the fight? What are we going to provide that the nation needs? Don't roll out the old jargon, the old answers. Answer the question. We have to do that. Next slide. So there's my distant cousin and relative, Douglas MacArthur, for whom I was named. He did better than I did. Uh, he was right. Douglas MacArthur, though, failed as chief of staff of the Army. Douglas MacArthur tried to do a lot of the things that I briefed you on. He tried to change the personnel system. He tried to establish uh, examinations for a general staff system. He tried to establish examinations for promotion. He tried to stipulate standards in the field. The officers he put on the board came back to him after two and a half years while he was chief of staff and said, if we do what you want us to do out of the army of 220,000 that we have right now, there are perhaps 10 officers who will actually make the grade. Now, I think we have to understand that those were different times. I think we're in better position today. But there has to be something other than the cronyism that I discussed earlier. Because it, it's a hit or miss proposition. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. The point is, the next 10 years are not going to resemble the last 10, I would argue, the last 20. We're into a new period now, fundamentally new. The deficit I worry about is not fiscal. It's intellectual. We don't need to go back into the interwar mode of the 1920s and 30s. These places, the war colleges, the staff colleges from the Army side were disasters. Uh, General Gorman wrote a wonderful study, went through it in great detail, when Marshall became chief of staff, and he finally got the executive order that allowed him to reorganize the War Department, which was the Army and the Army Air Corps. He immediately shut down Leavenworth. He shut down the service schools because he said, everyone in those places is living in the last two weeks of World War I. And he said, we're going to have to learn on the job. And then he pu started pulling out his book with all the names of people that he thought were capable and he started promoting them. And by the way, he wasn't always right. Between March of 1942 and May of 1945, Marshall presided over the relief of command of 32 division and corps commanders. That's a serious war. And it was a war we had to get over with quickly because Marshall understood, and Eisenhower later becomes president understood, Wars, if we fight them, need to be short, sharp, decisive, and rare. Long wars benefit no one, least of all the country that wages it. I'll leave you with this one final thought here on the slide. <sighs> Obviously, we need free play, we need organizational change, we need all these things. But I think Washington, uh, after he had left the presidency, said it best. He said, give Give this country 20 years of peace, and we will develop economically to the point where no one in the world will dare challenge us. He was right. Look at the 20 years after the Constitutional Convention. Look at the size of our population. Look at the economic boom that took over. It is our economic power 
that is the foundation for our military power. 